So we'll just start with a little body scan. Feeling the heels and how they contact the mat. So feeling right heel. And then feeling the left heel. And noticing any differences between right and left sides. And noticing how that information communicates up through into the knees. and up through into the hip joint. So in other words, what information can you glean from the way the heels rest on the floor to how your femur sits in the pelvis? and allow the back of the pelvis to rest. Again, noticing any differences between right and left sides. Maybe one side of the pelvis feels heavier than the other. And just feeling the muscles then that run along the spine. And how the shoulder blades rest on the ground. So any differences between right and left shoulder blade? Maybe one side feels heavier. And again, what information can you get from the shoulder blades about how the arms rest on the ground? Noticing curve in the elbow, curve in the wrists, curve in the fingers. And then bringing awareness to the curve in the neck. How the neck gently lifts away from floor. Finally, noticing the back of the skull. And how the head rests on the ground. So is there a tendency perhaps for the head to turn one way or the other? Is there a 
tendency for the head to fall back or forwards. So just noting how the head rests. So we're just making notes. And resisting that tendency to want things to be different to how they actually are. go of that specific body scan just get a sense of your whole body now all at once so take the perception really wide sensing whole body all at once So then gently from here, we'll move into our first posture, which is a flexion for the hip. So you can either bring your feet to stand on your bolster, or you can hug the knees into your chest. change the legs we we'll still let the back of the body yield towards gravity so if bringing the knees into the chest has caused tension in the neck and shoulders then maybe you'd want to opt for bringing the feet to the bolster instead so trying to be at ease in the pose. receptive back body receptive to that support coming up from ground so there's a give and take action here that's happening through the back of the body You're giving weight, pouring weight into ground, and the ground is supporting, taking your weight.
as we come into the last minute, maybe there can be more softening. Softening in the face. Maybe a softening of the fingers. softening through the feet. Last few breaths here. If your feet are standing on the bolster, if you could bring them now into your chest, please. And just prepare for your reclining twist, so letting the knees fall over to the right. So the knees can be <coughs> up towards the armpit, the right armpit, if you wish for the twist to be higher up the spine. So I'll just come and place the bolster on the top leg. If that's not comfortable for you, then feel free to take it away. So the legs are like the anchor, heavy, falling into ground. And then against the weight of the legs, the left shoulder blade seeks the floor. Choose a comfortable place for the head. So that in your mind's eye, the head has a relationship directly to the pelvis. There's a sense of through line all the way up the spine. And then maybe the jaw can soften a little. Maybe you can find space between the back teeth. And noticing is the tongue active in the mouth. And if the tongue is active, how does it feel active? Could there be a softening of the tongue? And does that softening in the tongue and in the jaw affect the rest of the posture. Again, just noticing.
So I'll take the bolsters off the legs now, but if you want to stay in your twist a bit longer, feel free. So then when you feel ready, gently coming back uh, to lying on the back, feeling the pubic bone, the navel, the breastbone, the throat, the crown of the head, all in a line. And just for a moment, making note of any differences between right and left. So then when you feel ready, bringing the knees back into the chest, please. And setting up your twist on the other side, so knees can fall left. time it's the right shoulder blade that seeks support. So the right lung is really open. There can be an intention perhaps to breathe into that open side. So the breath moves the ribs, which help to facilitate that turning of the spine. So spine moves ribs, ribs turn spine. And all that movement is carried by the breath.
space between the back teeth, soft tongue. So if you feel you need to move back to lying on your back after this pose, please, please do. Otherwise, we're going to stay lying on our left side. So if you just stay lying on your left side, if that feels comfortable. But if you need to come back to lying on your back, feel free. And we'll set up the, the next pose, which is cat pulling its own tail. So from lying on your left side, your top leg, your right leg, is your anchor. And your bottom leg becomes your tail, <laughs> your cat's tail. So your bottom leg slides backwards. Your top leg stays over your body like a twist. And your right arm, your top arm, tries to hold your tail. So the further you draw your right knee backwards in space, the greater stretch you'll feel on the quadricep. You can also play around with the back bending feeling, so the top arm opening up to get a stretch across the front of the chest. So there's belts around too. If you feel like you would rather hold on to a belt, let me know. So cat pulling his own tail. So already we've introduced some patterns into the spine. Our first posture was that feeling of a forward bend where the knees were hugged in. And the second posture, the twist. And now this reiterates the twist with a back bend pattern. So back bends open the front body. So in the front body, there's a feeling of collarbones moving away from each other so that you can find space at the throat.
You know, it's totally legitimate that the cat might get tired of holding his tail. So you can release your tail if you want to at any time. You'll still get the benefits of the pose with the front heart opening. Last minute here, cat pulling his tail. So it might be that in the last minute you decide that you want to come out and lay on your back, that's totally fine. Or you might be happy to stay here as you are. Or perhaps there could be some softening, taking support from ground. Easy breathing. And then in your own time, releasing your tail and very easily just finding the back of the body, resting on the back of the body. And just checking in. Once again, noting any differences between right and left sides. So we'll prepare to do cats pulling his own tail on the other side now. So bringing the knees into your chest, please. And then allowing the knees to fall right. Your top leg is your anchor. Your bottom leg becomes your tail. And this time it's your left arm that seeks to hold the, the bottom foot. And so you can tweak the posture to access different areas of the body. So the further you draw your bottom knee backwards behind you, the more you can access the hip flexor, the quadricep. Or maybe you choose to emphasize the back bending quality. And what role does the position of your head play in the back bend? Just 
space between the collarbones. Front heart opening. So there are always options, knowing that you can release the foot at any time if it's causing you tension. Last minute here, cat pulling his own tail. And so this time when we release from the pose, I'm going to have you lie on your right side and curl up into a little fetal position. So as you release your tail, curl up on your right side. And just take a moment to introduce a forward bending pattern. A forward bending pattern. So there's just a little counter pose here. So from here we're going to take another back bend, Sphinx. We'll take the shortest trajectory to get there. So I'm just going to have you roll over onto your belly, right where you are. And I'll bring the bolsters up to you so that if you want to use a bolster for Sphinx, you can. Alternatively, you can just have the elbows under the shoulders you want a block for your head, you can have a block for the head. If you're a sensitive lower back, you might want to just rest your head on top of two hands, stacked one on top of the other. Or you, if you have a very open back, you could take the variation of seal which is to straighten the arms and lift the chest high. Otherwise, find your variation of Sphinx.
And while you stay in Sphinx, I'll just read you an excerpt from Rachel Remen um, in her book, Kitchen Table Wisdom. And she writes, coherent, elegant, mysterious, aesthetic. When I first earned my degree in medicine, I would have not described life in this way. But I was not in, on intimate terms with life. I had not seen the power of the life force in everyone, met the will to live in all its varied and subtle forms, recognized the irrepressible love of life buried in the heart of every living thing. I had not been used by life to fulfill itself or been caught unaware by its strength in the midst of the most profound weakness. I had no sense of awe. I had thought that life was broken and that I, armed with the powerful tools of modern science, would fix it. I had thought then that I was broken also. But life has shown me otherwise. Many of the people who now come into my office as counseling clients have come because modern medicine has failed them in some way, or they have used up its power to help them and they do not know what else to do. They hope to find a way to heal, to cooperate with, or even strengthen the life within them. After listening to hundreds and hundreds of their stories over the last 20 years, I think that I would have to say that most people do not recognize the strength of the life force in them or the many ways that it shows itself to them. Yet every one of us has felt its power. We who doubt are covered with our scars of our many healings. So when people come, this is the place where we usually start talking about life itself and our attitude towards it, our experience of it, of our trust or distrust of it. Developing an eye to see it in others and in ourselves. In the beginning is the life force. After more than 50 years of living, I have learned that it can be trusted. Last minute here in Sphinx. If you're ready to come out of the posture, you can just lie straight down on the belly. And perhaps you're happy just to stay and soften. So from here we'll move into a supported child's pose, a wide need supported child's pose. So pushing the pelvis back towards heels and taking your knees as wide as your mat and then taking your bolster between the legs, 
so that it can support your front spine. So your pelvis meets the heels and the bolster supports the front spine. If the pelvis doesn't meet the heels, then put something there, a blanket, a block, a cushion. And turn the head to one side or the other so that the head feels comfortable. If your head has been turned to one side, then turning it now to the other. And the poem by Mary Oliver, which is called It Was Early. It was early, which has always been my hour to begin looking at the world. And of course, even in the darkness, to begin listening into it especially under the pines where the owl lives and sometimes calls out as I walk by, as he did on this morning. So many gifts. What do they mean? In the marshes where the pink light was just arriving, the mink with his bristle tail was stalking in the soft-eared mice and in the pines the cones were heavy, each one ordained to open. Sometimes I only need to stand wherever I am to be blessed. Little mink, let me watch you. Little mice, run and run. Dear pine cone, let me hold you as you open.
so from here slowly gently rising up and if you take the bolster behind you there is a purple block and a blue brick on top of it so if you take the bolster and pop the end on that structure then you can lie back into a reclining butterfly just from where you are so the knees come wide the back of the sacrum touches the bolster as you lie backwards over it you might want a blanket on top of the bolster for your head you might want cushions under your knees so let this part of your pelvis touch this yeah up even more and then the soles of the feet touch so the knees come out to the sides So if the knees feel like they need support underneath them, feel free to, to bolster up the knees. Your chin, more or less, should feel like it's running parallel to the floor. You might need a cushion or a blanket under the head. So observing the inner landscape of the body can be like looking on a beautiful painting. Observing how different images, sensations, emotions, thoughts suddenly appear in the foreground. And then in the same turn, they can become the distant background and disappear. observation of sensation. Like a scientist making field notes. What is being uncovered? What is being discovered? Where is the location of sensation? What is its quality? How much information can you gather?
the reclining butterfly taking support from the bolster behind you so a sense of falling back as the front body opens So in, our, in the womb, we were in a C curve. And then once we were born, we were placed on the floor or in our cot or on our stomach or on our back. And we learn to bond with gravity through both the front of our body and the back of our body. And some people feel a deeper bonding to earth on their front, others on their back. So now, how can we unfurl the spine to bond, communicate, and establish a relationship with Earth through the back body? Falling back. So the front body can open. Last minute here. Releasing from the pose, gently bringing the knees towards one another. And then just rolling off the bolster to rest on one side or the other. So we'll finish with two postures that will connect seamlessly. The first one is the yin version of an inversion, and the second will be a supported bridge. So when you feel ready, coming up through to sitting. So one of the ways that you can come into this yin version of an inversion is to sit on the bolster. So Kim, if I put you in. (coughs) So you'll sit on the bolster and round your pelvis so that you can fall backwards, taking your hands behind you to come all the way back to the ground. And then the legs go up into the air. The other way is to come in from lying down, lift the pelvis high, pull the bolster under the pelvis. And then send the legs up. So this brings back the C curve feeling. (laughs) 
So don't feel obliged to keep the legs um, perfectly perpendicular to the floor. Let the pose soften. As you let the pose soften, you might find that you discover something new. Christina Feldman writes, every moment of true attention is a moment of wonder. It is attention that allows the conclusions and assumptions of the past to fall away freeing us to see all things anew. Deep attentiveness is profound sensitivity. We are touched and taught by the events we encounter. Without full attention, we skim over the surface of life. Our capacity for love empathy and intimacy is awakened through our willingness to be wholeheartedly present in this life. Alienated from authentic attentiveness, we long for the future. We long for dramatic life experiences. But in learning the richness of deep attentiveness, we discover wonder in the simplest sight, sound, encounter, and feeling. So from here, gently allowing the knees to fold in towards the chest. And then one at a time, allow the feet to touch onto the floor. So the knees will stay bent, the feet will touch the floor. And you'll find yourself in supported bridge. If you need to readjust the position of the bolster, do so that the pelvis feels supported. And the lumbar spine should be hanging.
and a story from Rachel Remen. It's called Beyond Perfection. Wholeness lies beyond perfection. Perfection is only an idea. For most experts and many of the rest of us, it has become a life goal. The pursuit of perfection may actually be dangerous to your health. The A-type personality for whom perfectionism is a way of life is associated with heart disease. Perfectionism can break your heart and all the hearts around you. A perfectionist sees life as if it were one of those little pictures that used to appear in the newspapers over the caption, what's wrong with this picture? If you looked at the picture carefully, you would see that the table had only three legs or that the house had no door. I remember the aha that these pictures evoked in me as a child. I wonder now why anyone would, would why anyone would want to take such satisfaction in seeing what is missing, what is wrong, what is broken. The pursuit of perfection has become a major addiction of our time. Fortunately though, perfectionism is learned. No one is born a perfectionist, which is why it is possible to recover. I am a recovering perfectionist. Before I began recovering, I experienced that I and everyone else was always falling short, that who we were and what we did was never quite good enough. I sat in judgment on life itself. Perfectionism is the belief that life is broken. Sometimes perfectionists have a parent who is a perfectionist, someone who awarded approval on the basis of performance and achievement. Children can learn early that they are loved for what they do and not simply for who they are. To a perfectionist parent, what you do never seems as good as what you might do if you just tried a little harder. The life of such children can become a constant striving to earn love. Of course, love is never earned. It is a grace that we give one another. Anything we need to earn is only approval. Few perfectionists can tell the difference between love and approval. Perfectionism is so widespread in this culture that we actually had to invent another word for love. We say unconditional love. Yet all love is unconditional. Anything else is just approval. The pursuit of perfection is built into every professional training. But long before I went to medical school, I was trained as a perfectionist by my father. As a child, when I brought home a 98% on my exam, he, he invariably responded, well, what happened to the other two points? I adored my dad, and my whole childhood was focused on the pursuit of the other two points. By the time I was in my 20s, I had become as much a perfectionist as he. It was no longer necessary for him to ask me about those two points. I had taken that over for myself. And it was many, many years before I found out that those points don't matter. They are not the secret to living a life worth remembering. That they don't make you lovable. And they certainly don't make you whole. So from here, lifting the pelvis, pressing into the feet and rolling the bolster down to catch the knees. So feel free to have a blanket over the body or a blanket under the head. Or maybe you want an eye bag over the eyes. So just letting the body settle. And really take time to get comfortable. So any clothing that needs to be adjusted or back to 
to bonding with gravity. Just noting for yourself how the back of the body now contacts the ground. The heels. The backs of the knees, the hips. the back of the pelvis and muscles running along the spine the shoulder blades backs of the arms noticing the curvature in the elbows wrists fingers and how the back of the head now rests. getting a sense for your whole body all at once. And allowing this body to breathe. gradually lengthening the exhalation and allowing the inhalation to naturally deepen. This is a very gradual growing of the breath, lengthening the exhale, deepening the inhale. And then when the breath feels full, finding movement in the fingers, Maybe some movement in the toes. So continuing to breathe and move. Maybe you want to have a stretch or hug the knees. And 
as you breathe, just noticing now which nostril feels more open. And then finding a way to gently roll towards that side. As you rest on your side, notice anything arising now. Notice anything coming to the foreground. And just making note of, of what that is. And then when you feel ready, slowly coming up through to sitting. So finding sitting, bringing the hands to the heart. Inhale to lift your heart and exhale to drop the head. coming to practice.